Please welcome Alex Palermo. We're down here. I love being the last speaker that you'll hear today because there's no end deadline that I have to meet. <laughs> Don't worry, my speech will only be about two or three hours. We should be able to get out of here sometime this afternoon. I also feel compelled to put a bookend on Jamar's story this morning. I love the passion and that it came from his heart. I often teach my students that same thing, but I also have an experience about having to share a story about the birds and bees with my son, who at nine years old was traveling with me in a car, and we happened to drive by a dairy farm with numerous cows present. And right at the moment, as we were approaching this one section, one cow decided it would be fun to get a piggyback ride on another cow. <laughs> My son saw that, and I saw him see that, and I went, oh no. <laughs> and so I said my most favorite prayer, help. <laughs> and sure enough, he turned around and he said, Dad, did you see what that cow did? And I said, yes. He says, what were they doing? And I had to decide at nine years old, was it appropriate to tell him? And I thought, now's the time. <laughs> So in as simple of a nine-year-old language as I could, I laid it out for him. And he got really quiet. And I saw his brow furrow, and I saw him stare into the air conditioning vent of the car we were driving <laughs> for several minutes. And I repeatedly go, help, help, help. <laughs> and he turned to me and he says, but you only have to do it once, right, Dad? <laughs> That nine-year-old boy is now a 33-year-old man with two children <laughs> and contemplating a third, so you do the math. <laughs> Over 60 years ago, the popular American humorist Will Rogers said, Congress is so strange. A man gets up to speak and says nothing. Nobody listens, and then everybody disagrees. <laughs> Not much has changed over the last half century. Come to think of it, that's like most of my meetings at work. <laughs> Thank God for Toastmasters. Why does Toastmasters exist? Who can tell me? Who's brave? Why does Toastmasters exist? Anybody? Chickens. Uh, Mike. Toastmasters was started by a guy who wanted to teach people how to communicate to each other to try to better his community. All right, it's right there in our club mission statement. We provide a secure and positive environment that helps nurture public speaking skills. But what does that really mean? We talk a great deal about the art of public speaking, which we should, but we rarely address its opposite. I've been a Toastmaster for three and a half years, and I have yet to hear a speech on the art of public listening. We don't talk enough about being supportive, connected speakers, but we should. If for no other reason than the selfish benefit that good listening brings. When we were married, Marina Well said, I didn't listen to her. At least, I think that's what she said. <laughs> I wasn't listening. I always got in trouble for not knowing what I didn't know I didn't listen to in the first place. Not listening can get us into big trouble. So I propose that we start a brand new specialty club called Most Masters, where instead of concentrating on speaking, we concentrate on listening. Why most masters? Because we gain the most when we learn how to actively listen. The simplest definition of active listening is listening not just to understand, but to listen and understand beyond understanding to understanding and seeing and identifying the core truths in what's being communicated. Even more importantly, we draw the best from a speaker and increase our takeaway opportunities when, when we visually communicate our interest and our support. 
many months ago at the Laguna Beach Club. The speech evaluator said that while the speaker did spread their eye contact around the room, they paid particular attention to one individual. Me. At the risk of sounding egotistical, there was a reason for that. An intention behind gaining that attention. We communicate our support to a speaker in the way we listen. In the way that we want to dialogue with that speaker. We partner with them in their conversation. We support and bring out the most in the speaker by sitting up, leaning forward, and visually demonstrating that we're interested in their topic and their content. If a speaker feels supported, they're going to raise their game and give us their best because we, they see that we're engaged, intrigued, <coughs> connected. I listened to an interview, I think it was on TED Talk, where a supposed expert on communication said, we don't actually have to make affirming sounds and act like we're actively listening, when we are, in fact, actively listening. I disagree. When we not only look, but act supportive. For example, when we nod our heads and smile, if we agree, we invigorate a speaker. If the speaker feels supported by you, you're going to get more of their eye contact. If they feel that you've partnered with them in their conversation, they're going to give you more of their attention. It's only natural that we would look to those who we feel more supported by. Imagine an entire audience engaged in active participation. The speaker wouldn't know where to look. But imagine also how motivated and empowered they would be because of the value that the audience has placed in them and in what they came to say. That's huge. We get the most when we partner in the conversation. When we each, all sides, share in the conversation. It requires more. Your enthusiasm, your focus, your participation, your energy. Because getting more requires more. But who wants to just get more when we can get the most? Get the most by being and becoming a most master. Times about listening, and I agree with you. That's so important. Sure. Go for sure. It. All right, he's going to explain how we put it all together. So I'm a bit of the antithesis, antithesis from Jamar. I script everything, and I write it, and rewrite it, and rewrite it, and rewrite it, and rewrite it until I finally have to sound, tell myself, "Stop writing." And I say, "Okay." And I honor that demand for myself and I step back from it. And I'm notorious for having several speeches. I have several speeches right now that if I felt so inspired, I'd deliver. But I step back from them and I let them firmament, if you will. Ferment? Maybe that's what I want. Ferment? <laughs> that's that wordsmithing he was talking about. And when it's time, I come back to it and I read it again. And I read it a few more times again, and then I'm stepping back from it, and I'm trying to be a little more alive. Because for years I was a musician, and you have to play up what's happening in your audience at the time when you're performing. And in a sense, a speech is a type of performance. And if all I did was stick to the script and I ignored my audience, I would be a very bad presenter. So I have to take in what's happening in the audience and adjust to my behaviors, my pauses, my pace, based upon what I see happening in the audience. I also take a cue from what I teach my students 
at work. I teach them to be good citizens. Not just good citizens out in the world, but good citizens at work. Don't cheat, don't steal, don't defraud your customers. And I talk a lot about leading with your heart. If you lead with your heart, the wallet will follow. The opposite is not true. Not in the long term. Because you'll be found out, you'll be caught. Lead with your heart, lead with your passions. So I try to build my speeches on things that I'm either passionate about, or that I feel very strongly about, or that I teach from work, that I write and present at work, I adapt it and present it in speech form. That's how I do mine. Okay, any questions for Alex? Yes. Yeah, I really like the speech a lot. I don't think I've ever heard a speech about listening, ever. And I like that. I was uh, kind of curious, there are some, you, also you do, you're a good positive, if that's a word. <laughs> But uh, I noticed that when I'm giving a speech, and I sort of sense it with you, are you listening to the audience? Because it's like there was one moment where you just sort of paused and just kind of let everything rest, and I felt like you were listening. So my major in college was music composition, and what I learned at university was music is the co-position of sound and silence. What makes music interesting is how it's juxtaposed with silence. So the same thing happens in a speech. When you really want to make a point, if I've talked for three or four sentences without stopping, much like I'm doing now, suddenly when I pause, whatever I say next is going to have a huge impact. So I better make a point. So those pauses are sometimes planned. Sometimes they're in response to what's happening in the room. Yes, go ahead. One thing that always mystifies me is the idea of speaking extemporaneously. Like even right now, asking this question, I didn't plan this question. I didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. I'm just really so amazed at the brain that we can actually get sensible sentences out of ourselves. <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, if all places, this room might have some thoughts on that. How does that happen? How do we open our mouth and things come out? <laughs> if you'll notice, what did Jamar say? Well, I happen to be late of his Okay, so letter. Jamar talked out of his own personal passion and belief. Yeah. He told a story about something that happened in his life. His yes? experience. To make it a little more funny, yeah. extremely funny, he brought out something that was from his past, from his life. Right. Daniel did the same thing. I believe the same thing. If you feel strongly about it, if you're passionate about it, if you experienced it, if you can embellish it and make it funnier than it really was, but it has its roots in reality, that's going to provide, the, I think, the greatest basis or foundation for a speech. So you just write the point knowing that you've already lived it or you've already written and rewritten it six times to get it just right, mm -hmm. and then you just let that come out. Yeah, and hopefully you have a sense of humor that brings out the edge of it, yeah. Uh -huh. I wrote a story about a nude beach, visiting a nude beach with my biological father. That happened. It's true. Yes, I embellished I gave a speech last month. I embellished it. But it really happened. And there were some really genuine funny moments in there that I didn't have to embellish. They were just there. <laughs> Literally. Hanging. <laughs> in the wind. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions for Alex? Yes, go ahead. Are you going to start at Most Masters? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that would be up to Marina Wells. She's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come. Thank you.